When the skies were dark and the heavens unguarded, when the moon lay silent in the broken earth, when mortals wailed beneath an infernal lash, a child of the hill folk wandered into the Woadwood, and from the lands of her ancestors to the refuge of the Alfar. Welcome everybody to Book of Dawn IOP Academy. I'm Tormented by Gnomes. I'll be your game master today. And joining me in our first prologue of this campaign is Necra. Welcome, Necra. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I can't wait for the prologue and let everybody know who Ariana is going to be. Fantastic. This has been in the works for a while. I'm excited for everybody to meet you. Um, but aside from meeting your character, uh, for folks who may not have seen you just defenestrating the crap out of people in our Red Sky City <laughs> campaign, why don't you go ahead and just tell a little bit about yourself, where people can find you, so on and so forth. Yeah, so if you didn't get a chance to see me as Zara in Red Sky City, uh, my name is Necra, and I am an esports commentator and host. And for the most part, you can find me on Twitch doing random shows with Overwatch, Pokemon, Battle Royales, and, and the likes, um, and TFT, of course. But uh, yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Necra, newly. It's no longer Necra Gaming, everybody, but just Necra. Um, and then you can also find me on Twitch at Necra as well. Uh, quick, I have a question for you, actually. Uh, Lemon just hit me up. It's fine, if, it's fine if the rest of the party watches your intro, right? Or do you want them to shy away to protect your secrets? Gosh, no, of course. I feel like it's going to be fun to be able to like get to know everybody. Um, and I feel like at some point, Ariana as a person, it wears her heart on her sleeve in a lot of ways. So I feel like she would be very open and very honest with the people that she's going to be in a party with. So I'm cool with it. <laughs> All right, perfect. So, yes, if you're out there and you are going to be on the show, you're welcome to stick around. Uh, let me bring everyone up to speed a little bit. Yeah, sorry, Levin, I threw you under the bus um, asking there in <laughs> chat. Let me bring everyone up to speed a little bit about what this show is about and how it's going to work. This show is set in the four kingdoms of Anakra, just like Quest for the Book of Dawn. In fact, it ties pretty closely into the origins of that quest. But it takes place, and I really should have checked my notes and, and had this right in front of me, about. 500 years before those times. And at this point in the world of Anakra, the sovereign of Earth, Arakura, has been stabbed through the heart by a blade forged of her own blood. The Infernals, fiends from the hungry darkness, rampage across the Earth. Great empires are raised up to serve them and to enact unspeakable cruelty upon their fellow mortals. Throughout the mortal world, these demonic imperiums reign over vast swaths of the continents and everybody who lives in their territory has to flee or submit. Scattered around in various pockets, hidden in the hills, underneath the earth, are little groups and civilizations of folks who are able to live free, but hiding and in fear. And in a few other places, protected by powerful magic or by dragons or all sorts of other things, there are a few civilizations that have held out against the fiends. It's a dark time, it's a scary time, but if you happen to live in one of these protected areas, there are still people creating beauty and developing relationships together, and otherwise life goes on. Our story is set during this time, and this particular story starts out in the forest near the Sunswept Lands, uh, where a very young human girl, I would say, what do you think, two, three years old? Yep. Yes. Exactly what I was thinking. And honestly, we can't go into too much detail here because Ariana's not going to remember much of this. You know, being so young at the time, she, I would say that probably some of her earliest memories are just her in the forest. How she got here, who knows? But one thing maybe you can tell me is when she looks back onto this early, early memory of being alone in the forest, what is she feeling? What, is, what are her emotions? So early on, I feel like Ariana would remember playing a lot in the forest itself. I, I think she was a very free-spirited girl, uh, you know, very independent and and also uh, maybe maybe a little bit in, in neglected in some ways, you know, being allowed to go out in the woods by herself. 
Uh, I don't think she'd remember the fact that she might not have had the best family life in that regard, but I think she would remember feeling wistful, feeling very adventurous, and really interested in what she was doing in the forest itself. So her early memories, they aren't fear. She doesn't feel alone or scared or confused. It's just wandering around happily, enjoying the wilderness, enjoying what she's around. What can you tell us about what she looks like? Ariel has long blonde hair. Um, she is, you know, blonde haired, green eyed, and she is pretty small in stature. Um, very, despite playing around in the dirt, very dainty in a lot of ways. Um, but also, you know, she's she's rough and tough around the edges, too. Not afraid to get down and dirty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and, and this actually, I got distracted because I'm the DM and I just like talking about your characters and finding out about them. This is the first of a series of four prologues. In each of these prologues, we're going to introduce one member of our cast and their character. They have already started work on their characters, coming up with their backstories, so on and so forth. But we're going to go deeper into what happens in their childhood, because when the story really begins and everyone's all together in the same place, they're only going to be roughly 11 years old. They're going to still be kids when the adventure starts. So we need to catch up with each of them up to that point figure out the defining moments in their life, learn a little bit more about them, and make some mechanical choices as well. This first session is going to be a combination of storytelling, role-playing, and character building. All right, so Ariana wanders out into the woods just exploring, just having fun, just enjoying herself, and she remembers smelling smoke, but it wasn't scary, you know? There's, there's always campfires where you grew up, but the folks, you, you remember people hiding the fire and hiding the smoke and trying to trap it in wet blankets so that it wouldn't give away their position and always being secret. There's just little bits and pieces of things from your old life that still filter in. But on this day, uh, say in the evening as the sun begins to set and the sky turns this beautiful golden orange color, the same color it turns when there's smoke in the sky. When the, when the land is on fire, the sky becomes that much more beautiful. And you remember that, that, that smell of campfires and this light streaming through between the trees and golden leaves drifting down to the ground. And the forest became strange because I imagine that Ariana, even though she was so young, she spent a lot of time in the forest, right? You just told us she's alone mm -hmm. a lot. So this is sort of her, her happy place, her comfortable place. Well. The forest became unfamiliar, but beautiful, wondrous, full of light, and the trees were, were taller, and they grew at strange angles, and their leaves seemed to sparkle with a golden trim around them, and the wind whistling between them took up this, this musical sound like wind chimes. And it wasn't disturbing at all. It was nothing to be scared about. In fact, it was fantastic. And that is when... You wandered through a grove, an unfamiliar grove, beneath a tapestry of dangling leaves and spindly moss into a hidden city. And it's been a long time since you first laid eyes on it. So I don't know if she would think about it very much anymore. I don't know if she would really dwell on the past. She seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, she seems like the sort of person who's more interested in where she is now and who she's with now. Mm-hmm. Sounds about right. The place that she now calls home is hidden inside this forest, past the Veil of Leaves. And it is a place of red and golden towers, strung with fire that hangs like curtains and garlands up along it. Tapestries of woven living flame hang in the sky, protecting you from the weather. And the sun is all, it almost seems like it just sort of rings around you. It's rarely ever nighttime at all. And this place is filled with songs in a language that now is second nature to you, but at the time you didn't understand. 
but the the lilting, long, beautiful, chiming, sad tones to it captured your heart in that very moment. And they were interwoven with the sound of hammers striking metal. These resonant chimes of hard work and effort, but beauty and craft all at the same time. And that is how you came to the hidden city that you now call your home and have called your home ever since, La Serre. Now that we've made it this far, why don't you tell me a little bit about, let's, let's figure out your ability scores. So you've already said that she is rough and tumble, but dainty, right? Yes. All right. So between strength, dexterity, and constitution, strength being just physical oomph, constitution being resilience, and dexterity being nimbleness and balance, which of those would you say is the best for her? I think Ariana would be incredibly dexterous. You okay. know, while, while she is dainty, I think that means she's very flexible, that she, mm -hmm. she has a lot of, you know, natural ability um, to be athletic, but might not necessarily, you know, use that to her full advantage. Okay. And between sheer physical strength and just toughness and having a strong immune system, which of those two would you say is higher? Probably her, the, the inner strength, the, the okay. immunity and, and yeah. <laughs> All right, constitution. So of her physical stats, her dexterity is going to be the highest, followed by constitution, followed by strength. Mm -hmm. And when she came to this place, she would have met the denizens, which were a, a tall, graceful folk, uh, almost immaculately clean, except for the ones who worked in the forges. All of the people of this city work with fire, but in ways that you've never seen back wherever it is that you came from, which you can barely remember now. Uh, they were, they looked like something out of a story that you've been told. They didn't look like anyone you had ever encountered amongst your home where people, you know, wore furs and, and hid as much as possible. These folks wore fine raiment, uh, in, in all sorts of different colors, mostly reds, oranges, and yellows, warm colors with the occasional blue or very bright, vivid green. They are adorned with jewelry. Uh, gold. This is probably the first time you ever saw real gold. Lots mm -hmm. of bronzes and gold, beautiful woven filigree, uh, earrings and necklaces and chains around their hands and wrists and all sorts of things adorned with precious stones that capture the light and reflect it in a thousand colors back. Uh, what would Ariana's response to folk like this be? What, assuming that you didn't get an immediate read on them. Would she be more sort of awestruck? Would she be shy? Would she just be super friendly and walk right up to them? How would she respond to them? I think Anna would be very awestruck, uh, especially given the fact that she's still young. Mm -hmm. uh, this is still around the time that she would have had some amount of memory of where she came from. Mm -hmm. She likely came from very humble beginnings. Uh, not a lot of money, not a lot of food on the table. Um, which is probably why she spent a lot of time in the woods trying to collect her own things to eat. Um, but seeing that kind of lavishness is just something that would have been unfamiliar to her. So I think awestruck mm -hmm. would be the right way to put that. Okay. And when she was out in the woods as like a little two to three year old, what was she mostly getting? Like when she was looking for her own food, that's super young, but it's not out of the realm of possibility, right? So what sort of stuff yeah. was, she, was she nomming on? She was, you know, she was picking up mushrooms, trying her best, you know, it, it, I, I feel like fruits and nuts and berries definitely would have been on the list of things as well. How she didn't die up to that point, I couldn't really tell you, except <laughs> she had a good nose and was able to sniff out whether or not something was poisonous, I guess, you okay. know, could uh, tell a little bit of a difference. All right. We might end up with the survival skill by the time we're done with this, depending on how this goes, <laughs> or the nature skill. We'll see. We'll see. All right. So the people here, I think they would have responded to her at first with a little bit of shock, depending on who, who she first met. 
because nobody expected to see her. This place is supposed to be completely hidden. And as she grew older, living amongst these people, she came to know them as the Alfar. The, in their language, they just call themselves the Children of Dawn. That's what the word Alfar means. She began to learn their language. She began to eat their food. They would have, I think what would have happened is they would have reacted to her with shock at first, but they would have been friendly. They would have been like, oh, there's this kid wandering around in the middle of the woods eating mushrooms. How is she still alive? Come over here. Have some real food. Uh, they would have sat you down with some, some fruits and, and things, which again, nothing like what grew. Um, I don't think that your character would have ever tasted a citrus of any, any kind. Mm -hmm. And so now this little kid has just, you know, fruit juice all over her face and pure <laughs> spring water and you no, know, the wine that's later. You can have that later. And they gently asked her questions about where she came from and how she got here. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm guessing she would answer them like a two to three year old. Yeah. Which is not super helpful. Very enthusiastic, nope. but not super helpful. <laughs> In time, well, very shortly, actually, there was one of these people, one of the Alfar, who was the first one to find you. And you came across her at her forge, which was near the outside of this settlement. Um, if I had to come up with a visual, I would say, take Rapunzel's tower from Tangled. But instead mm -hmm. of it just being this one tower in the middle of this, you know, rocky sides and then this grass field it's much wider than that it's got this almost permanent golden red sunlight coming down on it and all these metal towers rising from it very elegant not you know not like not industrial not big bulky things but spirals and and you know it, it looks like if you took jewelry and just made a city out of it that's what it would look like this idea of the slender elegant, beautifully crafted whispers and, and fingers reaching up towards the sky made of metal. Wow. And she was adopted by somebody who she came across near the outside of the city who was working in a forge, but not with her hands. You would have seen people cooking before and your village would have at least had a blacksmith or somebody who could make basic tools. This woman was humming to herself with her hands in the forge, pulling apart the fire, pulling apart strands of it, running it between her hands, weaving it together, and then setting it back down and just humming to herself as she went. That was the first time that you met any of these people. And over time, you came to learn that she was older, much older, an elder in this place. It was kind of hard for you to tell. I, maybe you would have gotten mm -hmm. just the barest impression of, of this, this depth, this time abyss, this sensation of sort of grandmotherliness, but with very few of the visual indicators, just you know, some creases at the corner of her eye and something in the way that she looks and the way that she sighs and the way that she smiles that has this weight of years on her. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the reasons why you took to her so quickly is because she makes fantastic food <laughs> when you like she uses her supernatural like control over fire to just you know cook like an absolute fiend and after <laughs> grubbing you know trying to find edible bark and mushrooms that won't make you puke for a long time when you showed up and she was just whipping up a three-course meal with magic in the kitchen that was hard to walk away from that's easy to lose track of time yeah so I've been driving a lot here and I want to make sure that I'm leaving room open for you. Is there any questions that you have or anything that you want to add in here before we continue? No, I think this all sounds fantastic. And it sounds like you hit Ariana spot on from what I'm hearing so far. All right. Awesome. So let's talk about her mental ability scores. Uh, these being intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Mm -hmm. So. 
One of the things that we know for sure about Ariana, though I don't know how much we've discussed it yet, is that she is smart. She is bright. She is clever. She has a knack because as her story continues, she is going to start taking to the study of magic. And mm -hmm. we're going to talk more about exactly what kind of magic and how she goes about it. But we know for sure that she is going to be incredibly clever. Did you want her to be a wizard? I think that's what we discussed beforehand. Yeah. All right. Then I would strongly recommend making intelligence her highest mental stat. That okay? Yes, that sounds good. All right. The other two mental ability scores are wisdom and charisma. And... One of the other things that you've told me about Ariana is that she is deeply hospitable and friendly and cares a great deal about the people around her. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can come across in a couple of ways. That sounds to me like charisma, just being extremely friendly, extremely personable. Wisdom, mm -hmm. aside from you know noticing things, having sharp senses and such, is also about getting a read on people, being able to evaluate people, sense what they're feeling and such. So between those two stats, which one do you want to say is higher? Wisdom or charisma? I think charisma would be higher in this sense. Um, I, you know, while Ariana obviously has grown up around people that share vast knowledge and wisdom, I do think that one of the reasons why Ariana is the way that she is is because she's always kind of been able to get what she wants in a few ways mm -hmm. um and that's where i think the charisma kind of comes in is that everybody thinks she's cute and she's friendly and she's fun to be around and you know she's just a happy-go-lucky kid that hasn't mm -hmm. really gone through any major issues in her life yet that would have made her otherwise or, or start to think otherwise okay foreshadowing maybe <laughs> <laughs> excellent excellent <laughs> All right, so I will probably probably off camera because it'll make better footage. Um, for the time being, I'm going to give her the following ability scores. And like I said, you will have the ability to... Okay, so first I'm going to make it so that chat can actually see this. And then I'm going to give her the following ability scores, which you will be able to customize later. You have an eight strength. That's your weakest stat. A 13 dexterity. A 10 constitution, which is average. A 15 intelligence. A 12 wisdom. And a 14 charisma. Do you want to swap any of those around? And again, we can get even more noodly with it later. Does that sound good? Or do you think, you know, oh, I think uh, actually, you know, dexterity is more important than uh, wisdom or what have you? No, I think that sounds spot on all right awesome oh and you know what let me actually remember to show chat there so this is ariana's character sheet we're working on it piece by piece so far we've established you are human you're a wizard you were raised by the alfar which is going to affect your racial mm -hmm. abilities you're not just going to be a straight out of the player's handbook human and we've got your ability <laughs> scores down All right. You're also a child. Uh, and being a child is going to have a couple of more effects in the game, but we'll, we'll get to that down the line. That is going to change your move speed. So that's only a 25. It's going to change your hit points because you're a kid. Uh, but it's also going to make it really hard for people to hit. If anybody hits you with a critical hit, they have to roll a saving throw or it's not a critical hit because, oh my god, you're trying to murder a child. How could you? Uh, and you can run through people's squares. You know, if there's like a grown-up standing in your way, you can just slide right past them because you're yeah, right under their legs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're also going to give you... I'm using a supplement called Grazilax's Guide to Ancestry, I think. And it's a way to break out of the more deterministic species rules from the player's handbook. It gives you a lot more noodling around. Mm. As a human... You get the special ability adaptive, which means that once per short rest on any D20 roll, you can add one D4 because the idea is that humans are sort of jacks of all trades. You're raised by Ninia, who is this older Alfar. She's a fantastic cook. Uh, she speaks really loudly, especially when she's speaking 
common. Like when she's not speaking Elvish, she has a bit of a thick accent and she yells a lot. Uh, it, it's a lot easier to sort of regulate the the emotional wavelengths of Elvish, right? In Elvish, she's very, you know, a slight little bit of inflection here and some more emphasis here, uh, but it's a lot more flat when she's speaking common. So she's loud. She works with metal. She works in the forge. She often has soot on, on her hands and on her face, but she works with it by literally weaving the fire. And the first thing she did after she, you know, who are you? Where'd you come from? Except more of a hello, little one, was she fed you. And she just sat there and listened to you. She's a fantastic listener. And little two to three-year-old Ariana just talked and talked and talked while stuffing her face with fruit and drinks and all sorts of things about what sort of stuff would Ariana just be talking about? You know, I think that a lot of what she would talk about is like her, I feel like she would have a pretty vivid imagination. So she might have tried to introduce Ninia to all of her imaginary friends that she found in the forest. <laughs> uh, I feel like that would be kind of like the first thing that she would start talking about, probably talk about how good the food tastes, uh, maybe some of her own adventures that she's been able to have, finding beautiful springs and, you know, but, you know, she, she also probably is a little bit poignant as a child and probably points out like, wow, the people here look really weird. Um, <laughs> You know, this is this is abnormal. Uh, you know, they they all sparkle like a thousand suns. Um, and I feel like she would just be pretty on the nose about that. Yeah, not subtle Especially at all. As a just, child. Yeah. You know, that, that kid in the grocery store loudly commenting on everyone that they see. Do yes, you know? I, that was me also when I was younger. <laughs> we role play what we know. Yeah. <laughs> do you know? Do you, Necra, know anything about? uh ariana's imaginary friends yeah i would say you know i mean let's make this up on the spot here okay we're, we're gonna go full full role play full Excellent. imagination here uh we've got barney mm -hmm. um barney is a friendly boy who is you know very into music um, I would say that, you know, Ari uh, Ariana listens to a lot of the sounds of the forest and, and kind of expects that Barney is the one that is creating these noises and creating these kind of fascinations with with nature and sounds mm -hmm. and the the things that she hears. Um, so she considers Barney to be a, a very good friend. Um, I would also say that, that she also has a. Kind of like a like a maybe a sister figure in her life because as an only child she didn't really have anybody else to talk to i would i would call her trish um you know trish was somebody that was always there for her it was a great listener you know when ariana needed to talk to somebody about something or she she hurt herself or you know trish was kind of always there to console her so ariana kind of looks at her inner strength as trish in a lot of ways Funny thing about imaginary friends in a magical world, they they aren't always. <laughs> All right. Excellent. So I, I want to let give you the opportunity first. Um, do you know why Ariana didn't go home? Yes, I do. So Ariana got very, you know, she she smelled the the fire. She could she could hear some, you know, vague screams. You know, she she kind of remembers that. And for some reason in her head, everything was telling her to just keep going, go forward, keep adventuring, keep exploring. And so, you know, she was trying to take a different path that day that she had never taken before. And she noticed the trees were getting larger. They were getting bigger. The world around her seemed to open up and be just this explosive amount of color and wonder and awe. And she just got lost in it all. I, I think that she just kept going forward because she wanted to see what was going to happen next. And everything in her mind was telling her something wasn't quite right at home. Okay. Well, she definitely doesn't remember any of the Alfar trying to make her leave. Mm -mm. Like there wasn't the slightest 
effort. If there are any conversations about what do we do with this human kid, they were in a language that at the time she did not understand. Yeah. Ninia's wife came home later that day after you'd been sitting there for who knows how long. Maybe it was a few minutes, maybe it was a few hours, maybe some days had gone by. Time is different in the refuge. Her wife, Caraticus, came home wearing, perhaps if, when you first saw Ninia, the clothes that she was wearing were wondrous and wild to you because most of the hill folk wore furs or, you know, uh, tunics or leathers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But what Ninia was wearing was just, work gear it was just work gear of elven make to you it was a wondrous thing so when caractus uh came back wearing literal plumage <laughs> and just like outrageous all over the place color tons of feathers and in, in all of her gear uh that was jaw-dropping i'm pretty sure i know exactly what she said <laughs> what is that a bird <laughs> that's a strange looking bird <laughs> Gratis looked at you, looked at Ninia, looked at you, <laughs> and whispered a lot of things very quickly in the Alfar tongue. And a conversation took place. Ninia was like, all right, just, you know, this is Ariana. Go ahead and enjoy your fruit. We'll be right back. Uh, there was a conversation of some kind in the next room over. Whether it weighed heavy on Ariana or she was too distracted with whatever she had in front of her. Um, but by the end of it, you were staying at their house. And you never left. You haven't left yet. When our story picks up, at least, you hadn't left this place. You were free to explore it. You were free to walk around it. Um, all these people lived different lives. Some of them lived up in the towers and occasionally came down. Others lived a little bit away in the golden forest surrounding it, um, in their own homes. The, the streets were very three-dimensional and very odd and twisting, not laid out for horse and cart at all. It was clearly art had a lot to do with the layout of the city, a lot more than practicality, and everyone was fine with that. And so, yeah, it really was, it wasn't, it didn't feel like a formal adoption. It didn't feel like, it just sort of felt like, hey, I, I wandered into the woods, crashed at the stranger's house, and that's where I live now. What did she spend most of her time doing after that? Because there were other children, but they were very different from her. I don't think that on the most part they were unwelcoming, not by nature at least. Uh, but I think Ariana would have been a little skeptical at first to, mm -hmm. to play with these kids. And I think especially taken to Ninia so quickly, because, you know, Way to a girl's heart's through her stomach, right? <laughs> um, especially hers. But I think what Ariana would have done is I think she would have spent a lot of time in the forge with Ninia mm -hmm. watching what she was doing in awe, mesmerization of the fact that she's putting her hands in this fire and everything is just coming out so beautiful and gracefully and, and just, you know, I, especially with that being one of the first things that Ariana really witnessed with the Alfar, that just always stuck with her as a big, important key aspect in something that she found really beautiful. Okay. So it took her a while to warm up to, she, I imagine she would have spent some time wandering in the forest like she used to, but now mm -hmm. it's this new forest. And did she ever go looking for the path back? Even if she didn't intend to walk it, like even out of curiosity, did she ever go looking for it? Or did she, she never, ever look behind? I think she did, but mm -hmm. she never found it. She yes. was never able to find her way back. You know, I, I think Ariana, yeah, Ariana definitely would have wanted to see if things were okay. Or, you know, maybe she's like, I, I've been here a little too long. Maybe I, I should try to get back. But there was no path to be found anymore. Mm -hmm. The way had changed. Yeah. The way had changed. So even though... So how long was she sort of reluctant to talk to other people there or interact with other people? How long was she sort of clinging to Ninia and her wife 
who was a, a lot more, Paratus is a lot more kind of, I don't want to say harsh. Uh, and, and it's odd because Ninia is extremely loud when she speaks common, but just very kind, very patient, very understanding. And Paratus talks very quietly, but it just conversation to conversation, topic to topic, all over the place. She mm -hmm. plays, it, her whole thing is music. She is a musician. She plays a stringed instrument you'd never heard of before. She's incredibly good at it. Her music is sad. And it's, it's sad in a, an odd way that doesn't really... It was hard for you to describe, maybe even at, as, I don't imagine as a 10-year-old, you'd really be able to verbalize it very well. But it's beautiful, but it's very sad. And that's her whole trade. She goes out, she makes up new songs, she plays for, for the other Alphar in the streets. Uh, they don't really do money or economy, not amongst themselves at least. They seem to have what they need. Everybody has magic of one kind or another, whether it's mm -hmm. a powerful or just something small. Everybody has magic. So you went from a place where you were literally out in the woods. You, a two-year-old, were out in the woods looking for food to a place where it's, it's just everywhere. It's almost effortless. And, you know, Karatis makes her whole living just playing songs. So she is not as attentive a caregiver. She's also much younger. A again, it takes you a long time to kind of read the Alfar for these things. But you can tell that Ninia is much, much older than Karatis, who is, acts a, uh, you know, like I said, a lot more flighty all over the place, but still caring and affectionate in her own mm -hmm. way, just not as focused. Yeah. So how long does Ariana sort of keep to herself or just stick with Ninia before she starts interacting with other people? And how does that go for her? I think Ariana would have taken about a week to just watch what was happening at the forge, you know, before she started wandering out, starting to to look for different things and exploring the city. I think the forge would have been her area of wonderment for about a week. Mm -hmm. After that point, I think news would have spread about this new human child being around and being in the in the city. And so when Ariana would go out, you know, she she gets some stares. I think she would she, people would point at her or start whispering to each other. And she would always get a little bit of this kind of feeling that like, you know, ooh, you know, not necessarily that something is wrong. But like, I think she would know as a human child and, and just her perception ability that that there was something a little bit off about the conversations that were happening that were d around and surrounding her. So, from... so I think maybe another week would have passed before she would have started talking to people and people would have become a lot more friendly to her as okay. well. So it's not like she sort of lost her human identity. She was, that was something that stuck with her over the next eight years that she spent in this place. Um, mm -hmm. But over time she did warm to people. Some of the, you know, the elves have a very different perception of time than humans do. And one of the first things, things not one of the first things but one of the most obvious things we don't have to get there just yet is that as you age you grew much much faster <laughs> like most of your peers were were already like you, you again hard to tell what age they are but they acted like kids who were a little bit older than you right they looked like kids mm -hmm. who were a little bit older than you but by the time that you turned 10 or so uh you looked older than them and that altered their whole perception and their whole speed. They could easily lose days at a time focusing on one thing. Uh, is that how Ariana sort of worked? Was she, did she find herself adapting well to that timeless experience? Or is she kind of more impatient? Yeah, I think Ariana would have been the type of girl that would have taken a lot to the culture that were, the Elfar mm -hmm. found themselves connected with. I think she would have started to change the way that she dressed. Uh, to be able to fit in. And I think that also she would have, you know, especially eating their food and drinking their drinks and, you know, wandering the city and, and realizing how fruitful everything was there. I think she would have found that very comfortable, very comforting, and would have adapted accordingly in order to really fit in. Awesome. All right. So a little bit of an adaption period, but then she takes to it really, really well. As mm -hmm. a human raised by the Alfar, 
you're going to start out speaking both common and the Alfar dialect of the Elven language. Uh, as somebody who comes from the Hill Folk, even though you aren't with them anymore, you also start out proficient in the persuasion skill. And that just reflects how, how friendly and personable Ariana is. So those are a couple of things that we're just going to go ahead and get out of the way right now. But you also get one more thing for, we're giving you a mix and match of elven features and human features because you are biologically elven, but are you biologically human, but culturally <laughs> a lot elven. Mm -hmm. As you grew up and you met all sorts of different people and you saw the different crafts that they practiced, again, everybody interacted with magic in their own way. Uh, magic is a part of the lives of the Alfar. It, it, from again, even if you're just a cook, if your whole life is making food, magic is part of that. You may never learn more sophisticated spells, but you have magic that can enhance flavors and chop things for you, uh, read the taste buds of other people so that you can match their palates. Everybody experiences magic in different ways. Ninia is the one who explains that to you as time goes on. She explains bits and pieces about how magic works and that it is it's a part of the world it is a flow of energy it's something that you can attune yourself to gather it in with yourself shape it with your mind your will and your thoughts and then let go of it and so the process of spell casting is something that you understood at least on an intellectual level from a very, very, very young age. As Ariana grows older, the Alphar don't have like a schooling system. They don't have a, an education system. They are very unschooled. Their, their kids just wander around. They're taught things by their parents, but also by anybody else who they want to hang out with. It's, it's a very free-flowing society overall. Mm -hmm. You always detected just bits and pieces, and you never really caught all the way onto it, that there was, there was some sort of social hierarchy at work. There were silent rules of etiquette. There were things that you do and don't do. There are ways of telling who's in and who's out, but it's never fully all the way out. It's more, this person you know, has a little bit more respect, or this person's a little bit less respectful. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was, but it was always difficult to fully understand why that was the case. It was a very, very subtle behind the scenes sort of thing. Um, as Ariana learns more about magic, and she over time learns that this is almost the extent of Ninia's gift. All of her magic has to do with fire and shaping things and making things. Her magic and her art are the same but there's a lot more in this city. What would she, would she expand her horizons? What would she spend her time doing as she grew older? I want to paint a picture for you because I think this is a very important piece to how Ariana became interested in the magical arts. One day she was walking through the woods and as she usually does, she, you know, picked a few flowers, but she came across one that was unordinarily beautiful. And so she picked it, she took it home to show off to Ninia. And after a few days, it started to wilt, it started to die. And I don't know if the Alphar have an actual way to bring things back to life or preserve them in some aspect. But Ninia could see that the fact that the flower was wilting, the fact that it was starting to, the life was starting to get drained out of it, she could see that was a little upsetting to Ariana. So that was how she got introduced into magic. Okay. I have a couple of things to say about that. Uh, but Chad has something to say first. Behold, an act of God. Oh, perfect! Absolutely perfect. <laughs> All right, gentle wind. A gentle touch eases your pain. 
So this is the presence of the Titan of, I believe, the Titan of the South Wind Zephyr, which is a, a soothing wind, a healing wind. I'll confirm this. I could have the exact details wrong. But that could not be more timely or thematic. Yeah, Zephyrus, the gentle wind. Okay, so uh, I think what we're going to say is that she was really sad about it. And th at that exact moment, a gentle wind came through and it felt like it, it was a breeze, it was warm, it was calm. It felt like, uh, like a hug or somebody brushing your hair or patting you and assuring you that everything was going to be all right. And mm -hmm. the flower in your hands came right back to life. And Ninia would have paused for a moment, taking this in, looking at all of this. And I don't know that she said anything right away. She may have said something just as, you know, that's strange in common or in the elven tongue <laughs> that, you know. In her very loud voice. Exactly. A curious wind. And I think that she would have taken that in. That's actually really cool. So if this hadn't happened, I think that she would have directed you to somebody in the arts of enchantment or in the arts mm -hmm. of transmutation. But this is this is almost a sort of sign. So I think she would have directed you to gardens, gardeners, people who work with the earth, people who actually, you know, till the land and and uh, grow flowers and all that sort of thing, because that is another form of magical art, or at least it's a place where the magical arts can intersect. All right, sweet. So. You were you brought up the idea of magic that, that can preserve things. Mm -hmm. And that is something that resonates deeply, deeply with the Alphon. As you learned their language over time and started to learn some of their songs and some of their stories, uh, the Alphar live, this place where they live is full of magic. It's full of light. And when Ninia tries to explain it to you, she, she calls it wishes or she calls it... Um, dreams made real but ultimately once you start to learn it's called dawn magic it's all that is left over of the time before before the world was a scary place before there were separate worlds before any of this most of the elves songs are about when the whole world was like this and nobody aged and nobody died and they could make of themselves whatever they wanted to be just by wishing it, just by thinking it. Mm -hmm. And they sing of, of a city more beautiful than this place. And of craftsmen and musicians and warriors far more powerful, far more skilled, whose songs were that much brighter than what they themselves make. Half of their music and their stories are laments for this lost time and this place that they've built it is very much an attempt to recapture some of that beauty, some of that lost light. So the, the moment that you are talking about the flower and sad, that it, it's wilted and it's not what it once was, that absolutely strikes a chord. That is, that is an, a deeply elven thing, or at least it's the start of a deeply elven thing. Once you get to the other side of it, where you've just sort of accepted that it's starting to fade and you're just left with the loss, not the wish, anymore that's a deeply elven thing but then when the flower springs to life in your grasp that catches their attention and so they send you to spend time in the gardens with the folks who tend the earth tend the trees tend the herbs and those sorts of things uh, how does ariana respond to this sort of work it's it is scholarly there is a lot of teaching to be done if you spend more and more time there You'll start to learn the names of the different plants. And in a very poetic, story-driven approach, you, you learn what different plants need and how they draw nutrients from the soil and all those things. But it's also a lot of hands-on, grubby, dirty stuff. Does she take to it well, or does she sort of shy away from it? 
think Ariana would take to it well. Like we were saying, she might be a little rough around the edges. I think that she's not afraid to get down and dirty, play with some dirt, play with some plants. And, mm-hmm. you know, it also really resonates with her because a lot of what she was doing when she was exploring by herself when she was two, three years old was a lot of, you know, what kind of different plants can I eat, right? And <laughs> and also, you know, what what is beautiful about this world? What can I do to you know, keep some of that precious life alive. And I think she would have taken a lot of the lessons that she learned from the gardeners and would have started to do some of her own experimentation Mm. with some of the plants that she would have found in the forests surrounding this beautiful city. Okay. Are her experiments mixing and like making uh brews and teas um or are they more tying into the actual magical energies and seeing if she can feel them and call them forth what what how would you angle this i think it would be more about the latter so it would be more about looking at the magical energies seeing if she can like change the color of the flowers that are there taking white blossoms trying to turn them pink um, you know, adding details like paisleys or I, I don't know what kind of artistic things existed in this particular world. So we're going to go with paisley. That's the first thing that stuck out in my mind. Good enough. Cows um, exist. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Uh, and maybe cow spots or, or something, but just like trying to change the way that like the form of a plant was structured or you know what if i gave it a little bit more of this or if i gave it a little bit more of that you know Mm -hmm. what differences come into the fold all right there are are two consequences to this the first is that together we've discovered what alfar trait she gets and that is that she is incredibly gifted just at magic itself not necessarily any better at the theory of magic. Uh, She's not super, maybe alchemy is something she'll pick up in the future, but it's not something that, you know, she starts out with, but she starts out from an extremely young age, already able to cast the prestidigitation cantrip. So before beginning any sort of formal lessons, she just has an innate knack. Now it is driven by her knowledge. She has to understand, she has to study things, she has to learn things and figure them out as she goes. It is still largely driven by her curiosity and her intelligence, but she just has an innate gift for channeling magical energy. That's just a part of her. So we're going to go ahead and give her the prestidigitation cantrip. Like I said, if I can. going to have to learn how to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe Necra does, but Ariana doesn't. Like... <laughs> All, because it just means it, it's a spell that basically does ex- all the things that you just described. It literally does all of those things that you just described and anything else that you can think of that is a. I'll post the spell so that you can take a look at it. But then Thank we you, have active God. <laughs> yeah, then we have another one. So. At an age when. Most elven children are beginning to develop their magical abilities. She gets the spell Prestidigitation. It's a minor trick that lets you create uh, little sensory effects like showers of sparks. Uh, You can light candles. You can uh, clean things. You can adjust temperatures. You can create little magical gizmos and gadgets. Just, you know, like, behold, literally pulling a rabbit out of a hat. It's a magic trick spell, but it also lets you and it's going to be especially poignant and effective when she uses it with living plants and such. She can do mm-hmm. all sorts of small magical effects with living plants. And I encourage you to be creative and uh, don't limit yourself to what this spell description says that I just pasted. And it's on her character sheet now. Uh, but as long as it's not like, I want to use this spell to make this plant grow and choke that guy to death. As long as it's not going that far out, use your imagination. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now, beyond that... Behold, an act of God. (laughs) Spontaneous combustion. 
Somebody is going to explode. Hope it's not you. Great. Oh my God, this brings me back to Tales of the Golden Bow when I just set a fireball off. <laughs> if you remember that, yes. I'm not sorry <laughs> that that happened. Never apologize. Remember, <laughs> I didn't ask how big the room is. I said I cast fireball. <laughs> okay, so I think it's pretty easy for us to work this into the story. The... The people of this city, of this Alfar refuge, fire is sort of key to their art. It's, it's one of the binding elements that they all have in common. Uh, it's why they all dress in warm, rich colors. Uh, they're renowned for their metallurgy and for their, their art of fire weaving and their fire magic that they largely use for the arts, though they can apply it to defensive things. So I think what happens, unless you have an idea, which I will hear out, is that a lot of the plants that grow here are similarly these red, orange, yellow, rich colors. Uh, some of them are warm to the touch. Some of them, if you make them into a tea, it will literally make steam come out of your ears. The plants themselves are infused with this fiery magic. And mm -hmm. so at one point during her magical experiments, she's learned how to do these things, right? She's learned how to make them grow, make them float, make them spin, make them blossom into different colors. Uh, make them tie themselves into shape, whether they're alive or plucked. Preserve them so she can pick a flower, and with her magic, she can keep it fresh. Not forever. Not yet. But as long as she's tending to it, she can keep it fresh without water or anything else like that. But at one point, while she's experimenting and learning, something happens. Something goes wrong. And it has to do with fire. Do you have any ideas for that? All I can say is that I feel like Ariana might have caused a massive accident in the gardens. <laughs> um, I, I just see her accidentally setting a plant on fire or it, it, having it explode mm -hmm. and just like half of the field gets completely wiped out. Okay, I'm going to yes and that because of the magical nature of the plants as you're in this garden and your teacher uh, this, you know, I, I want to say botanist, but that's a little bit, you know, a little bit dry for the way that, mm -hmm. that the elves would interact with this. Uh, while there's plants and, and gardens and, and flowers and bushes all over the place, uh, she in particular has this garden, like this walled garden, this one specific where everything is arranged in particular patches, like pieces of composition of beautiful art. Right. I grew these flowers here because they fit well here. And, you know, a, a little bit like I'll let these two grow together and see what happens, because that's part of the artistic process. Not only do you light it on fire. But eight years later, five years later, it's still on fire. The magic energy there, it just continues to burn. It just won't stop burning. The plants don't burn down, but the fire sort of rages out of control. Just And it's this persistent magical flame that will not stop. Oh, God. That sounds like me. <laughs> All right. Uh, before I throw in my ideas of what some of the consequences or fallout of this might be, do you have any? Well, the teacher is not happy. And, you know, I think one of the consequences is that Ariana feels incredibly bad about the choice that she made. I think that one of the consequences might be that she takes a break mm -hmm. from doing anything too out of the ordinary, out of the box, um, and, and especially mostly to atone for the mistake that she made. I think mm -hmm. the other thing that she does is that she spends quite a long time trying to recreate what this garden looked like mm -hmm. in her own time as a secret project, not necessarily to, yeah, not really telling the teacher anything about what's going on here. It's, it's more of like, she wants it to be a surprise mm -hmm. um, and put her own flavor and maybe her own taste um, into what exists within these garden walls. I love that. I love that. I think that also as a consequence of this, whether she wants it or not, 
Ariana has extreme, an extremely powerful knack for fire magic. So uh, I don't know if that's something she's going to actively want to explore. I don't know how good her control is going to be. But when she uses oh. fire magic, it is particularly <laughs> strong. And that might don't be something. Don't think that... she's going to touch that for a long time. Excellent. Perfect. Even better. <laughs> so she starts like secretly in her own space that she picks out. Uh, does she like try to find space inside the city or does she start creating this out in the forest? What does she do with it? I, I think in the city people would find it. Mm -hmm. And so she doesn't want people to know that she is still experimenting, that she is still really practicing right now. Um, mm -hmm. Especially in this break where she's kind of promised everybody she's gonna, she's gonna take a chill pill for just a little <laughs> while. Um, so she went, probably would have went and found a place in the forest that was you know, close to the city, but not close enough that people would be able to find it. Mm -hmm. um, and and maybe in a little bit of a, an area that was already very pretty, uh, that you could have put up these decorative walls and, and really make this beautiful maze-like structure within mm -hmm. those walls that just had intense beauty with it. And I like the idea of her trying to recreate it, but she can't really go back to see the original because it's on fire. <laughs> and so over how long does she spend on this is she done by the time she turns 10 and we sort of are going to revisit her right before this story begins or is she still working on it she's still working on it it's not done yet oh i have plans i have such plans <laughs> excellent <laughs> i figured that left things a little open-ended for you big fan of that <laughs> all right so after this accident she spends a lot of time working on her secret garden, trying to get that up to snuff. But also, she can't really do what she was doing before, where she was learning magic through this garden, through the magical properties of plants, using them to understand the different types of magical energy interacting and such. So what does she do after that? Like, she, I, I think she would have to sort of find something new to do with her time. What would she get herself into? She starts listening to a lot of the a lot of the music a little bit more. You know, mm -hmm. she she remembers Barney from from her her younger past. Um, she remembers that you know Barney has always been there as the way of the the nature and the sounds of and of the birds and the animals that you hear in the forest. And she she starts to to gravitate a little bit more towards her other mother because you know the music that she produces and. The sounds that come out of this wonderful instrument, I think, would have been something that Ariana would have wanted to really take a closer listen to, uh, especially knowing what the what that kind of signifies for the Alfar culture, being very ingrained in the idea that a lot of this music is probably sad or sounds sadder because of these feelings that the Alfar have that are so deep inside about nature and about how the world was or once was and how it can kind of no longer return to that state okay i think this is when what we would norm what we in human culture would call her education kind of starts uh, mm -hmm. she's been really focused on on learning about nature about plants about just the the raw principles of how magic grows and flourishes i think that oftentimes when she is casting spells down the line she's going to use plant imagery and, pl and metaphors for you know planting the seed of the spell letting it grow and then plucking its fruits when you've let the, the energy build up in your mind and shaped it to what you want to create i think that's mm -hmm. going to be an important part with her but now is when she would start learning more about uh, art about the elven culture and about the history of the world and she would start to understand a lot of the things that she were, were just sort of shadows in the distance when she was young through song and the elven storytellers. And this could also make her expand her social circle a little bit because Karatis mm -hmm. is always out there, right? She's always interacting with the other Alphar singing in the temples and in the halls and in the streets or not singing, just playing her instruments while other people sing, uh, but dealing with the with sages and, and, and all sorts of folks from different walks of life. But I think this is when, Ariana would begin to learn and realize that they are very sealed off from the outside world. And mm -hmm. she always knew 
you know, growing up as like a two year old, you don't need to be told that the world has been conquered by infernals to know that outside is scary and we have to hide. Like that, yeah. but that's sort of the extent, right? You just learn that the world is is a scary, dangerous place. And this is when she would start to learn more history and more about the way that the world is set up and the way that the world works. Aside from just listening and absorbing this information and this knowledge um, and spending more time with Karatis, is there anything else that she would have done during this time? Anything significant, any important parts of her her growth and her story that we want to add on? I think as Ariana becomes more ingrained in the culture and learns a lot more about the Alfar in general, I think that she would have also started gravitating towards dressing the way that they dress um, mm -hmm. and and maybe getting very interested. She obviously loves very colorful things, very shiny things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think she would have been really interested in, in jewelry and maybe even at some point, even talking to Ninia a little bit about maybe getting to a point where she can make her own um in in some way so maybe not necessarily in a forge but maybe just like picking out stones taking a look at them putting them in patterns and like playing with them like you would like i did as with beads as a child um <laughs> we, we hey we all have the weird thing that we did when we were a child and for me it was playing with beads so <laughs> nah, I, I only laugh because it reminds me of of you know when my family had those craft kits and just yes the rolly oh. kit yeah, the roller kit just scattered everywhere, and yeah. you know, my, my sister had the the um, like the transparent pink with the sparkles in it box that kept all the beads in. Yes. And we each had our own, and you know, you get the strings and the ones with the with the letters on them, and just all over the place. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. <laughs> all right, I am. We're putting together the character now based on everything that you've told me, so. What I think we're going to do is we're going to combine a couple of things. Over the balance of these years, as time goes on, she's, she's learning about plants and animals and magic. She's learning about music. She's learning and she's learning to make things with her hands. If you had to choose between her learning an actual instrument or learning a craft, which would you say? I think she would be more interested in learning a craft. I think All she's right. very interested in using her hands and really like is a type of child that is very fixated on creation as mm -hmm. well as just very much being a tactical learner. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely something that she would be much more interested in. Okay, that is tactical learner. That's that is an important phrase, and we're going to take that into account. So we're going to do the following. We're going to go ahead and give her the nature proficiency as part of her background, because she's, you know, she spent so much time. It's such an important part of her life. She spent time in, in the garden, so on and so forth. As part of her background, we're going to give her the, the nature proficiency. Uh, we're also going to give her. I'm thinking, what do you think? Jewelry and gem cutting, or as a craft, or something else. That, I I think that she, I, at some point I think she would have gotten to a point maybe before she went to school mm -hmm. where she recognized that like she has a little bit of proficiency with fire. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you think about gem cutting and you think about making jewelry, you have to know a little bit about that in order to make sure that the stone the stone gets set. Mm -hmm. So I think that all fits together very nicely into Ariana's backstory. Awesome. So we're going to give her proficiency with a jeweler's, jeweler's equipment, essentially. Uh, and that includes little bits of pieces of, of fire, foundry, so on and so forth. She's not going to be out there, you know, competing on forged in fire, making swords and stuff. But anything like small, intricate metalwork and gem work. That's something that she is trained to do. And she has that magical aptitude with fire to make it that much better. Jeweler's tools. Done. All right. We gave her 
the nature skill, absolutely. Then, what would you say would be another skill that she would pick up in this time? I'm thinking it's going to be another academic skill. I'm mm -hmm. le leaning between arcana for the actual like theory and study of magic and how it works, or history for listening to all the songs and learning all the different cultural aspects of the Alfar. Uh, there will be opportunities to pick this up later, by the way, because you're going to school, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But from this time in her life, which of those two do you think fits better? Arcana, I think that even though she does have an affinity for people, mm -hmm. um, I think she she isn't the type of person, as you were kind of mentioning before, to dwell on the past or think about the future. She's mm -hmm. very much an in-the-moment type of person, and I think the Ar Arcana skill lends itself a little bit better to that. Just thinking about how, if she's in the moment, thinking about that skill that she's using or that magic that she's learning or whatever it is that she is working on, she wants to know how it works. And I think she sort of experiences everything through this lens of magic. You know, she, mm -hmm. uh, she understands plants and she's learned about them, but she, that is integral to her understanding of magic. And she's, under, she's learned about metalworking and fireworking. But again, that's just sort of, she has, I don't want to say a universal theory of magic, but she sees those rules. It's like when you become a mathematician and you see the math in every, absolutely yeah. everything. It's like that, but with magic. Everything that she interacts with, she starts to understand. So she has this, you know, she can't cite the, the 15 theories. She's not like a kid who grew up in, you know, gifted children's school or anything. It's not like she's been academically trained, but she has this very strong fundamental understanding of how magic works and how it interacts. So that's another thing that she's picked up. Okay, excellent. Found out that, found out that, and she would have learned a little bit more. The would she have any interest in combat skills, or is that something that she would have just completely shied away from? Neither of her parents were super martial, though. Almost everybody in the city, all especially all the adults in the city are trained in a fighting style that uses wooden staves with metal caps on the end. It's sort of, it's, it's a local martial art that they've learned. And uh, it, it's taught, not again, not in formal classes, but it's just sort of this art. And it's one of those subtle things you've seen that tends to separate some people from another. Anybody who's a, a master of a craft here has authority. That, that deep investment in an art, in beauty, that confidence, that focus on being really, really good at something that makes the world a more beautiful place, that gives mm -hmm. status around here. But one of the things that's sort of common to everybody is learning stick fighting, but with these metal shod staves, which are inlaid, beautifully engraved and inlaid with bits and pieces of that Alfar's story. But they're only given to adults. Once they pass into adulthood, they'll have one of these made with, and the, it'll be engraved with their family symbol. And as life goes on, they'll start to add little bits and pieces, all very abstract designs. They Like if they end up, if somebody killed a dragon, which no one here has done, they wouldn't literally just put them killing a dragon. They would put some sort of like scaled knot, you know, of, mm -hmm. a beautiful abstract design onto it. Uh, and the, the young, the kids, the younger Alfar, they start to learn stick fighting pretty early. Half of it is literally just what we did as kids. If anyone who grew up in the woods grew up going into the woods, <laughs> grabbing sticks and smacking people with it. Um, and the way that the Alfar adults usually correct you is they don't say, what are you doing? Get back here. They say, no, 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 you're doing that wrong. Here, let me show you. You do it like this. <laughs> that way nobody gets hurt. See, your knuckles hurt. That's what happens. Uh, is that something that she would have been excited by and drawn to or she would have kind of been bored by it and, and moved away from it? I think she would have been. I, I think mm -hmm. she would have been really excited about the idea of being integrated even more into the Alfar culture. That sense um, of belonging so I think, makes it immediately. Yes. I, I did have a thought, though, uh, not to stray away from the topic at hand. This but is a collaborative this, effort. Hit me. With the sense of time, mm -hmm. I think it would have also been important for Ariana to also share some of the human culture that we would have had mm -hmm. uh, with the Alfar, especially with her parents um 
her birthday, to be exact, was one thing that really stood out to me that mm-hmm. maybe the alpha celebrate them in different ways. Uh, obviously, their sense of time is very dismantled or mm-hmm. a little bit warped in some sense. But I think her first birthday being with her parents, I think there would have been a little bit of an issue. I think she would, I, I, she like, you know, especially growing up and as a kid, you know, like you just have this one special day in your life that you remember. That's like, man, mm-hmm. I get a cake, a cake and presents. Like, yes, please. Um, and, and, you know, even though she might not have gotten like the cake and she might not have gotten very, very big gifts, mm-hmm. she still got something when she was a kid. Right. Um, and so I think at her first birthday that she would have had with her parents, she would have gotten a little sad. I think she would have she wouldn't she would not have understood why on this supposed special day nothing was different about mm-hmm. what was going on in the world. This is perfect. All right. So Ariana would have been bummed out about it. And mm-hmm. which would, would she have talked to them or would they have because they would have picked up that something was wrong, but would she have talked to them first or would they have asked her first? I think they would have asked her. I don't okay, think Ariana yes. was the type of person that would have been like, you know, this is wrong. Um, or like, what is, why, why do I not have presence? You know, I, even though she is a little, you know, she's a child and she, she has the ability to be very pointed <laughs> with what she says. I think she, she also understands that at this point, at the next birthday, there, there's a little tact involved now with the way that the alpha kind of handle things and, and mm-hmm. how they talk and speak about issues all right this this is excellent this is excellent so they would have asked right and they would have been you know what's what's bothering you you would have explained it to them and they would have done their best to avoid looking at you like you had two heads because this idea is so yeah. strange to them <laughs> exactly but it's Im- it's important to you so like that day Obviously, Ninia is a fantastic chef. So she's like, what is this? It, it's a cake, right? It's some sort of a bake. So she makes something that is not a birthday cake, but it's delicious, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's an alpha approximation, first time model. And uh, Karatis plays you a birthday song. And in the coming years, as you start to make friends who are, I'm not going to say your age, because who knows how old they actually no. are. You don't. So Ariana certainly doesn't. Um, but they get the idea of a birthday party. And again, it's odd to them, but they're like, I mean, a bunch of friends. It, it, it sounds like a good time. So uh, I, I think that's something that would end up being uh, special for the other, for the alpha children, because they don't do this. Yeah, they have, there's all sorts of celebrations that they'll host throughout the year. Uh, but a birthday party is something unusual. So they're like, <laughs> yeah, sure. Great. And, and that ends up being, even the people who you barely interact with, they're like, oh, you're the one who has that thing every so often. <laughs> I remember that. We sang songs and like somebody got a pie in their face. It was great. You're, you're great. Uh, as you get older, as more birthdays rack up and the years go by, and it's very hard to tell. The seasons are not functioning here. That the, There's barely any fluctuation. It, there's a little bit. The outside world has some impact on this place, but it is a pocket of dawn magic in the fairy other world. So it's two steps removed from the mortal world. But somehow they manage. Somehow they figure it out. Maybe maybe you count, or you know they're they're helping you count because the sun isn't even doing the quite the right thing. So they help. They keep as good a track of it or better than you do once you explain to them how it works and how important it is to you, mm-hmm. uh, because they care about you. But as time goes on, you realize that the other Alpha children do have a celebration. Because you're a human, you're a growing child, you sleep a lot. You have to sleep a lot. Alpha don't sleep like you do. They just sort of trance for a while. They don't, like, they they have beds to relax and such, but they barely need any sleep. And they don't dream. Not the way that you do, at least. Mm-hmm. And dream, when you have dreams and you talk about your dreams, that is one of the things that is the most alien to the people around you. Because when the Alpha children go to sleep at, again, night, more air quotes, they live 
through the memories of other Alfar, of, of Alfar that have passed. They, they relive these memories and oftentimes they'll share in these memories. So if they're, a few of them are close together or good friends, when they enter the trance, they're just living the memory of some other Alfar and they're both experiencing the same thing. Wow. But eventually that changes as they grow older. They stop having these past memories and they start just having their own memories instead. Not the memories of other Alfar, but retreading, rewalking through their own memories. And that shift, that change is a sign of not adulthood, but moving on to the next phase in life. It's like turning 13, essentially. It, it's a sign that your childhood is coming to an end. The Alfar mm -hmm. have several periods of childhood. You know, the human brain doesn't stop developing until at least the age 25, and we still get to make important life-altering decisions before then. The Alfar don't do that. <laughs> They give you a very long runway. And when an alpha child has their first, a trance of their own, there's a big ceremony. They get a special red cape and a crown of roses, and they go into the center of the city, and they enter the fire. And when they enter the fire, they see a vision, and they get to pick one of their own names. And as time goes on, as the years roll by, as Ariana, you know, passes through being five years old, moves on to being six and seven, goes through these different developmental stages, becomes more curious, goes through a few ornery phases like you do, mm -hmm. uh, and, and her brain grows and she starts to see more and more connections and stuff. This is not an experience that she is ever going to have. It's not something that Ninia or Karatis ever bring up. They know how important it is. And I don't know if, if Ariana realizes this, but they know how important it is to you to, to be a part of this place and to feel like you belong here and that you have a community. And they, with every passing year, as more and more of the other Alpha children go into the fire and, and step out with new names, uh, you just keep having nicer and nicer birthday parties. <laughs> You know, every year there's something new. You know, they bring in somebody who's a, an actually fair, an even more skilled illusionist to do all sorts of wonderful magic tricks. And they have one at their home and one out in the woods and one at the music at the amphitheater with music. And every party gets gets cooler and cooler and, and more and more neat. But none of them are that one experience because that is not something that is not a threshold you are ever going to cross. How does that sit with Ariana? I think there would be a point that Ariana would have to have this kind of conversation with her parents. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think she might bring this up to Karatis, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think she'd have that curiosity to say to her, you know, why, why do I not get the same ceremony? You know, what is special about going through the fire and why is it that that's not something that I'm ever going to be able to do? Or, or you know, what, what age do I have to turn in order to <laughs> you get a chance to, to walk through the fire? Um, she would definitely know that it is a very sacred ceremony mm -hmm. and a rite of passage. She'd be able to tell uh, that something was a little bit different about the way that she she was. And I think that at a certain point, she might even ask the question of like, you know, what is different between me and the rest of the Alphar? And just kind of have a slight existential crisis of like, am I human? Or am I, am, am I Alphar? Kratos' response is interesting. She's a performer. She's very expressive. She's very emotive. She's, again, much younger than Ninia. But her first response, because she often reacts and then thinks about it and then unreacts or re-reacts. Her first response is, oh, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I never did it. Where I come from, we don't have anything like this. It's just something that the Alpha are here do. So there, there are Alpha all over the world who, who don't do any of these things. Uh, you shouldn't feel sad. You shouldn't feel bad at all. You, who are you? You're our daughter. That's who you are. 
And she thinks about it for a little while and get, probably gets distracted by something as well. And how does Ariana take that? I think Ariana would need to take some time to think mm -hmm. about it from a perspective of like, well, if I am your daughter and I am here and the other Alphar children get to do this, I need more of an answer than just don't worry about it mm -hmm. and because it's not that big of a deal. I think Ariana would be a little bit irked by that mm -hmm. kind of response. But she, um, she kind of sits on it for a little bit before she. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and and she would poke in in a very like respectful way. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, at that point, Heratus would uh, not quite do the the parental pass, where you say, "Uh, here, you take this one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, talk to your Idiot, mother. You take this. Not quite. <laughs> Almost that. Uh, more <laughs> pulling in reinforcements than just passing the buck." And together, they would... This is not something that's easy for them to explain. Because they don't experience what you do. They, they would gently explain that when they need rest, the Alphar just retreat back into their memories. And when they don't have many memories of their own, the memories of the Alphar that have gone before are there for them. Mm -hmm. It's like going out if, when you, you need to sleep, they just need to step away. It's like when you go out into the forest away from the city and you come back refreshed. That's, that's what they do, but in their own memories. And eventually when they start to forge paths in the woods themselves, they can walk those ways instead of walking the ways of their ancestors. And when that happens, it's a sign that they're beginning to become their own person. And that's when it's time for them to choose their own name. And the fire gives them a vision. It, it's the heart of the light of dawn in this place. The light that protects us from the passage of time and hides us from the outside world and nurtures us and, and gives strength to our magic. It's a place where the past, the present, and the future are all one. And we can see for a moment into all three. And when the Alpha are beginning to make their own way, they need to see into the distant, distant dawn. To who we were before we became who we are now. They need to see themselves from the outside. Because when you're inside the walls, you can only understand that part of what you see. But when you're outside the walls, you can see the whole city, and you understand where your part is in it. Mm -hmm. And they see not one future, but some of the many futures that they could choose. Because there comes a time where you have to start making plans and thinking about who you want to become. And those are the things that the fire shows them. But when you go to sleep, you make a place of your own out of your wishes, your hopes, your dreams, your fears, your memories, little pieces and, and thoughts and ideas that have come into your head, and even things you've never even imagined from places that we're never going to go. And that is what you're going to do your whole life. And that place that you make for yourself is going to change as you change and as more. Thoughts and, and feelings and people come and go through your life, what your mind creates for yourself is going to change every single night. Something new, something nobody has ever seen or, or heard of or thought of before. And that's not something that the Alphard do. That's something that only you can do. I think at this point, Ariana would understand what is going on. I think she would understand that, you know, maybe I have a, she might get a little bit of the wrong idea that maybe she has a special superpower or something that the Alphard just don't have. Uh, but <laughs> she would, she, like, she would understand, I think, that that ceremony is, is not something she's ever going to experience, mm -hmm. but that's okay. 
you know, she gets something maybe that's even better than that, which is an incredible life, fantastic birthday parties, and these dreams, these these wonderful dreams that no one else here gets to experience but her. You don't see your parents as as, as this contentedness and and understanding passes through you. You don't see the look they give of each other of dodge that one. Um, but the the moment passes and time continues to go on as as you get older and more and more of your friends undergo this ritual and you keep on working. Uh, mastering the arts of of jewelry and you start to do a little fire weaving of your own, not quite on the same scale and it's a lot easier for you when the fire and metal are bound together rather than weaving pure flames but Mm -hmm. you can do a thing or two you can do like a little knot made out of fire and that's informing your your sense of art and your sense of composition and you keep on working on this secret garden that you're making for for the, the herbologist too, the gardener whose garden you set on fire that's still burning. And (laughs) as your 10th birthday approaches, the garden is almost ready. You've been working on it literally for years and it's changed a lot of times and and parts of it have blown up, but you've rebuilt them. That's fine. They didn't stay on permanent fire. And the day is coming when your 10th birthday is coming up and that's going to be the perfect day for you to reveal this surprise that you've been working on for so long. And before we get to that day, we are going to go ahead and take a break, folks. When we come back, we're going to find out how Ariana's story continues and what brings her to IOP Academy. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Stay tuned. We'll be back in five minutes. <laughs> 